be a person or an institution. Sustaining research culture has been the most talked about subject in higher education, as there is nothing practical about the subject. With the complexity of managing a university or research institution, we are also in a risk of rankings, which has been appointed or considered as a proxy of quality as said by news president Tang Eng Chie, whereas the ANU vice chancellor, Professor Brian Smith, says global rankings are distorting universities' decisions. Another complexity is to put the right person at the right activity with the right supporting resources to sustain research culture. As part of the stakeholder of a nation, higher education and research institutions are also bound by social economic situation as well as the political will of the government. All aspects are beyond the reach of researchers and lecturers. Therefore, we need to learn from ENU that has a more mature research culture on how to maintain the sustainability of research and manage the complexity to the betterment of research in ENU. A legion institution to a legion person owned by ENU, Professor Jagadis. The discussion to uncover the uniqueness of strengths of the legion this morning will be led by Professor Yudi Dharma. So without due time, so Professor Yudi, time is yours. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi uh, Thank you very much, Professor uh, Hermawan. And uh, good morning uh, to all of the colleagues from ITB. And uh, uh, probably uh, we can start the, the discussion, right, uh, Grand Brick? Uh, before we hear some insight and, and idea from Professor Jagadis, uh, I would like to make some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, common rule for our discussion uh, after all. Uh, if you have a question after uh, I open uh, question and answer session, you can raise your hand or you also can write your question in the chat room. And uh, uh, our, our uh, staff will help uh, to, to, to combine and write the question uh, and then we'll be uh, appear in the uh, slide. So before we invite uh, Professor Jagadis, uh, I would like to introduce him uh, briefly and allow me to share the, the, the short uh, screen. Uh, I hope you can see uh, this short introduction. Uh, uh, today we have a topic uh, about how to sustain research excellence of the uh, to, for the long term. And uh, if we can check, uh, Professor Jagadis currently he is a distinguished professor in uh, Australian National University in the Department of Electronic Material Engineering. He have many qualifications as written here. Probably we can uh, check by uh, web by ourselves later on. And. Uh, uh, Jagadish uh, uh, finished his uh, study in India and uh, he got uh, uh, his PhD in the University of Delhi in 1986. And then he was a lecturer in the uh, University of Delhi. And then he moved to Canada uh, to do some uh, postdoc uh, research fellow. And then he moved to Australia in 1919. 1990 and established a major research program in the field of optoelectronic and nanotechnology. Uh, he was a founding director of Australian National Fabrication Facility and convener of uh, Australian Nanotechnology Network. Uh, previously, he also vice president of Australian Academy of Science and the secretary of uh, physical science in the AAS. And he also served as a president of Australian Metallurgical Society. And uh, up to 2019, he also the president of uh, IEEE Photonic Society. Jacob is also give some services and have uh, a distinguished uh, faculty position and whole honorary position in some university and whole world. 
uh, for instance, uh, in Oxford University, uh, Cambridge, and also some institution in China, including China's uh, Academy of Science, Nanjing University, and so on. Uh, he also uh, holds a position in Tokyo University, Anna and Mangalore University in India, and also in National Taiwan University, Taiwan. And uh, if probably, uh, I, I, I don't want to uh, read in detail, and we can uh, find easily from the website. And currently, uh, Jagadish uh, is a, a editor in chief for Applied Physics Review uh, papers. And before, he also editor editor in chief for Progress in Quantum Electronics and uh, International Journal of High Speed Electronic and System. He also editor position have editor position in Paris Journal as it's Springer I E uh, and and so on. Uh, he is the member of editorial board for more than 20 other journal. And the most uh, interesting thing is also his activity in social services. Jagadish and his wife, Vidya, have launched the Chenopati and Vidya Jagadish Endowment Fund to support students and research, researchers from developing country to visit Australian National University. And as I remember, in 2019, one of our students joined and participated uh, in this program. And Jagadish also initiated uh, another program called a Future Research Talent uh, in both uh, India and also Indonesia and some other country. And ITB, one of uh, the participants of that uh, program. Jagadish uh, received uh, many awards, probably uh, close to the 100. I don't, I don't want to read uh, all of them. And so the most important thing I think is uh, Jagadish was named as a, a companion of the Order of Australian for Eminent Service to Physics and Engineering in Australia Day's honors in 2016. And he also received many awards and an honor, including a two, 2015 IEEE Pioneer Award Nano in Nanotechnology, Walter Boss Medal from the Australian Institute of Physics, in 2019, Thomas Branco Lale, a medal from Australian Academy of Science and so on. And uh, you, we, 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 as uh, called by, by Professor Hermawan and Grand Prix, uh, we, we can easily check uh, the, the, the background uh, and, and research topic of Zikadis. Here, he already published more than 1,000 articles uh, with uh, 66 uh, edge, uh, index. And also, for more popular, uh, through the Google Scholar, we can check uh, uh, his uh, uh, research topic and uh, activities background. And today we will have a discussion with him uh, on the topic of how to sustain research excellence for the long term. And before we have a discussion, uh, Jigadish will tell us about his idea, his talk uh, uh, related to this uh, important uh, issue. So, uh, please, uh, we will give uh, a time uh, to Professor Jagadish, uh, and please, Jagadish. Terima kasih, Yudi, and terima kasih, Professor Hermawan, and uh, for your kind introduction. And uh, salamat pagi to all my friends in Indonesia. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum, assalam. And uh, so, you know, it's really great to see all of you virtually. And uh, I visited uh, two years back uh, uh, Jakarta and then gave a talk. And then I'll just share some of those things with you and then also talk about various things. And generally what happens is that whenever we see that somebody has achieved a lot and UD has kindly introduced me with giving all the credentials which I had, but sometimes people don't realize how difficult life has been for you before you reach into that point. And also sometimes what happens also that, you know, if a European person or an American person comes and talks to you, you always feel that, you know, well, they don't know my problems, you know, how difficult my life is. They can say whatever they want to say, but, you know, it's very challenging for us in Indonesia sort of thing. So that's the mindset we have as human beings. So that's why I really let me share with you some of my challenges and my failures in life. So thereby, hopefully you can be able to relate to what I had gone through, and so hopefully that will help you to motivate yourself 
to achieve the goals and dreams which you have for yourselves. So it has been mentioned that uh, UD has already mentioned that uh, you know, I have uh, in fact given this talk two years back for the diaspora conference, which UD has kindly invited me. And uh, so really he has already mentioned about all my you know, titles and various institutions. And I'm grateful to the various institutions for hosting me as uh, giving me the honorary positions. And the key message here is that I've collaborated with people from 30 plus countries and co-authors papers with them. So this really collaboration is an important part of it, which I'll come back to. So I started my life in a very small village in India and I come from a farming family. And uh, so, you know, my parents and grandparents used to do agriculture. My father was a school teacher, but then he resigned from the school teacher and gone back to farming. And in fact, in my village, there was no, uh, in my home, there was no electricity and I was, in fact, studying in front of the kerosene lamp until I finished my year seven. So there was no high school in my village. And then, in fact, uh, I used to get sick all the time. But now if I reflect back, I realize that because studying in front of the kerosene lamp, I was breathing a lot of kerosene smoke. So that might have also contributed my ill health. So then I ended up moving to a neighboring village. And then I stayed with my maths teacher. I'm so grateful to two of my high school teachers Without their help, I would be probably plowing the fields in India today. So I want to express my gratitude to my teachers for helping me be able to finish my high school. So then I had gone off and then started living in a town and tried to study my year 11 and 12. And suddenly, you know, I was completely free living with a maths teacher who was a very disciplinarian and then used to beat us up, you know, if I'm sleeping or anything of that sort uh, while I'm supposed to be studying. And two, suddenly you got all the freedom. I was only 14 years old or so. And then what you do, you goof up. I didn't do as well as I was doing very well in my year 10 or so. And it was a big surprise for all my teachers and my parents also. I was a good student, but suddenly I didn't do very well. So in those days in India, then in the state where I was from, our province I'm from, we only had about six engineering colleges and then I could not get into engineering. So of course, parents in India generally expect uh, your kids to do either engineering or medicine if you're good in maths or good in biology sort of thing, because they see that that is a pathway for the successful life for their kids. So then I'd gone off and did my BSc physics. I've done better than in, in my year 12, but nothing great to tell it right to your grandmother. So I got enough marks to, I didn't get enough marks to be able to get into MSc pure physics, but I was able to get into MSc tech applied physics with electronics as a specialization. And this is a three-year master's degree, which is essentially camping all the electronic engineering degree into three-year master's degree. So then I, there also that uh, I was busy with student union politics and all these things, you know, so they used to help out all the students to get scholarships and all these things. Again, I failed in my material science courses during that time and I'll come back to. And again, I, I in fact failed to get elected to the student union president. And uh, so then I said, look, okay, Stuart, politics are not for me. I really need to focus on my studies. And then from that time onwards, I started completely focusing on my studies. As I said, in my village, there was no electricity. Even during my PhD, I had to walk five miles after traveling from Delhi to by train by 24 hours, by bus by two hours, and then walk for five miles to go home. And uh, in fact, if it is raining or anything, I had to walk bare feet with no shoes or something. And then uh, there were no buses or any other transport available at the time. And my sister used to remove next day morning all the spines in my feet. So that really gives you some background where I come from. So some of you might not be coming from big cities, might have come from a modest background. And I hope you, you can relate to me. I also come from a very small place and then I also had a lot of challenges in terms of my childhood. But the world doesn't care how difficult your life has been. Only world only cares what you can contribute to the world. So that's something I want you to remember. It doesn't matter how difficult your life has been. With a positive attitude, we can achieve anything in life. Okay, And determination and persistence are absolutely critical, which I will come back to. And then when I started applying for my, after finishing my master's degree for jobs you know, in physics, and they used to say that you're not a physicist because you didn't do MSc pure physics, I used to apply for electronics engineering jobs and they used to say that you're not an engineer because none of your degrees in engineering. So then I'd gone off to Delhi University, did my MPhil and PhD in semiconducting thin films. And then afterwards I have worked as a lecturer. And then I used to apply for postdoctoral fellowships. In those days, there was no internet, there are no computers, there was 
mail. I used to mail my CVs to all the advertisements which are coming in Physics Today and IEEE Spectrum. But those magazines used to come to India by sea mail by six months late. I never, they never used to give deadlines and I used to apply for everything which I was applying for. So you can you imagine that how many rejection letters I would have got and then just to give you a number. And because in the room, I would have asked you the question, but since it's a virtual one, probably I'll not have time to ask you that question. But I got more than 300 rejection letters. I want to give you the number, more than 300 rejection letters, okay, over a three year period. But I've never given up. So then I came to know their professor in Queen's University in Canada, working in magnetic techniques for detection of corrosion in oil and gas pipelines. You know, he has a positive opinion about students from Delhi. Then I, since I'm not getting any postdoctoral fellowships in semiconductors in my field, I said, okay, what I'm going to lose, I might as well write to him. He was Professor David Etherton. In fact, he unfortunately passed away last year. And then he generously wrote back to me and then said that, look, he's applying for funding and if he gets the funding and he'll let back, get back to me. And after four months, I got an offer letter saying that uh, he's offering me a postdoctoral fellow for two years with the possibility to extension for one more year. So then suddenly I had to change my field from semiconducting thin films to learning about magnetic techniques, which I didn't know anything other than my bachelor's electricity magnetism course. That's about it. I didn't know anything. Of course, you've done research. That means you know how to identify the knowledge gaps. You know, identify. He wanted me to set up a new technique. And then I had to go and identify what equipment is needed. And I ordered for the equipment. I set it up. By the time I finished one year, I had enough results to write a paper. Apparently, he was very happy. But I didn't know whether he was happy or not because I was working my seven days a week and I was alone. And uh, so then, you know, I mean, it's a, it's 16, you know, 13, 14 hours a day sort of thing, because I wanted to learn and prove myself. This gentleman has given me the opportunity to work with him, despite the fact that I am not from his field. And I'm so grateful to him. I want to prove to him he made the right decision. Then another professor in the same department knew that I'm a semiconductor person working in magnetics. And one day he came and asked me, Jim Williams at the Australian National University is starting a new department of electronic materials engineering. And I know that your field is that, are you interested in going to Australia? Then I told him, unfortunately, Jim Witten also passed away. And then I gave my CV to him and he faxed my CV at that time to Jim Williams. After six months, I got to the offer letter saying that, are you still interested in coming to Australia? And they gave me a two year postdoctoral fellowship. And after first year, I'd gone back to India and my wife finished her PhD in botany. And then she came and joined, we got married and she came and joined me and we had a baby. And I came to Australia with a two month old baby and a two year contract in July, 1990. So really it's, you know, sometimes, you know, you, may, you don't, don't know what's going to happen, but you need to take chances. So that's what I did, okay? So then of course, you know, I've, when you told me that now I'm a distinguished professor and all those things, I really don't like to talk about myself because I want to stay modest. But at the same time, for the purpose of sharing that on how I have transformed from a failure to how we have been able to achieve my goals. But now I've got many recognitions as a physicist. I told you that uh, people told me at that one stage of my life, I'm not a physicist, but now everybody acknowledges me as a physicist, okay? Including fellowship of the Australian Academy of Science and various fellows, various, you know, the contributions to physics and various awards, which UD has mentioned as well. Then I told you that in my MSc tech, I failed in material science and I got many awards for my work on the material science, including International Union of Material Society has given its the highest award, SUMI award for my contribution to material science. I told you also that I failed in my, as an engineer, I could not get engineering, but now everybody acknowledges me as an engineer, including last year, National Academy of Engineering in US, which is the most difficult one to get elected to, they elected me as a foreign member. Remember that all my degrees are from India and I could not get into engineering. And then, you know, a, one of the most esteemed organization elects me as a foreign member. So that again, indication to you that everything is possible in life. You really persist and persevere and hard work and work smart and, uh, you know, don't give up. That's a message which I want to really give. And I hope my life gives you, my experiences gives you an example. And then hopefully you also feel motivated and then see that if Jagdish can do it, I can do it as well. And in fact, in 2016, Australian government of the Governor General of Australia has given me the highest civilian honor of Companion of Order of Australia for my service to physics and engineering, in particular nanotechnology. Okay. What is the probability of an young, young person coming from India, from a small village, 
coming to a foreign country like Australia, getting its highest civilian honor, which is given to the former prime ministers and, uh, you know, really business leaders and CEOs of banks and other things. But you know, what's the probability? Probability is very close to zero, but not zero. So that's the thing which I want you to really remember. That's all, you know. Again, I'm grateful to Australia for giving me the for recognizing me with this one. Again, I don't like to talk about it, but then you know, this I want to express my gratitude there as well. So now let me come to the research excellence part of it. So really, I give you two examples, two cases. And one, I talk about the institutions, what they need to do because that's sort of this leadership of the ITB are here. And it's really great honor for me to speak to the leadership of the ITB. Also that a lot of young people are also here, young academics. And I also give some advice to people. Those are institution may create a lot of facilities and opportunities, but if the individuals don't have the passion and drive, nothing may come out of it as well. So both need to be happening hand in hand, okay? So from the leadership point of view, my recommendation is that to create an environment and students and staff can achieve their goals, whatever they set themselves. And we need to create an environment where they can achieve those goals. For students, maybe educational opportunities, for staff, maybe research and their career opportunities, for example. Again, create a great learning experience for students in terms of providing excellent facilities. And also mentoring is very important for students. Because that's if you don't mentor them, you know, they lose the sight of where, where they want to go and then they can get lost. So that's why the mentoring programs by academics really meant acting like mentors and other things play an important role. When you're recruiting staff, you know, we need to really make sure that excellent people of excellence are recruited. So because if you don't have excellence, they cannot perpetuate excellence. So that's why your staff need to be really excellent. Okay. So that's a really, really important part of it. In fact, people tell, used to tell me a story President of the Harvard University in the old days, he used to sit on every appointment committee. Of course, now may be difficult because institutions have grown so big and all. He used to really sit on every selection committee and then spend time on selecting good people. And he used to say that, you know, once if I choose good people, I don't have to worry about the institution. They will make things happening sort of thing. So that's why the selection of staff is very important. And again, create a great environment for researchers to carry out research and pursue and motivate them to pursue research. Again, motivation part of it is leadership really need to motivate staff and academics and others as well. And collaboration, cooperation is more, is more beneficial to science and research than competition and conflict. In the old days, people used to think that you have to compete with each other, but now people are accepting competition is not really, is, doesn't create a good healthy environment. Collaboration and cooperation is the most important way collectively we can achieve much more better outcomes than really trying to fighting with each other. That's why I collaborated with people from 30 plus countries. And in fact, close to 40% of our papers are written by my collaborators. You know, I cannot possibly write every paper or my students cannot write every paper. So the collaboration is a really multiplier effect. The research infrastructure is essential. And if you don't have infrastructure, you may have brilliant ideas. You cannot really demonstrate those ideas. Those ideas stay as ideas. So that's why, again, institutions need to really create the right kind of research infrastructure. And by the way, also these need to be accessible to all. Sometimes what happens is that a professor has got an equipment, they may not be using it much, but they don't want anybody to use it. But that's a wasted investment in my point of view. So it is really important we really create an environment where people are sharing the pieces of equipment. Of course, people are always worried about breaking of equipment and all these things, but you need to train them. So that's why you need to have training programs and other things. So that's why I also recommend that, you know, dedicated staff to support research infrastructure. So these not necessarily be academics, but maybe people with research experience like PhDs, and then those who can look after the equipment and train people and things like that. In fact, uh, UD mentioned that, you know, we, uh, I, I served as a founding director of the Australian National Fabrication Facility, ACT node, and then that's what we've created here. Sometimes you may buy a, a expensive equipment, but you do not have trained staff and students make use of that one, the student leaves, the skills are gone. And then that means, you know, the next person doesn't know how to use it. That becomes like a white elephant or otherwise, you know, they, they don't use it appropriately, it breaks down, for example. So there's, you know, in between academics and uh, administrative staff, there is something called a technical staff and all. Some professional staff can be very valuable. In fact, that's what we convinced our Australian government when you're giving money, don't give money for equipment, but we also want you to, while you're giving equipment money, need to be also provide some operational costs in terms of staff and operational costs. 
So thereby these machines, these equipment is really allowing us to be able to produce the best possible outcomes for the country. This again, you may like to let the Indonesian government make them aware of it. Instead of giving $10 million for the entire equipment, maybe give $7 million for the equipment, give $3 million for operational costs so that we can get the best out of those equipments. Also equipment becomes, you know, uh, the, with, with, in due course of time, because they are not state of the art anymore. So that's why more we use it, better it is as well. So you're getting the best out of those ones as well. Freedom to pursue research. And again, you know, this again, you know, this, sometimes people try to do top down approach, you know, sometimes it doesn't work that well. There are two ways to do that one. You know, there are big projects like, you know, if you're building an atom bomb, for example, you need to have a tight top down approach. But then if you want people to be creative, you need to have the bottom up approach, something, for example. So that's why this is an important one to really give the freedom to uh, academics to really pursue their research. And sometimes, you know, the institutions overload people with so much of teaching load, they really don't even have time to think about any research because they're spending, you know, preparing for lectures and marking you know, the, the, the scripts. And, you know, that's sort of a need to be balanced carefully. And sometimes in between the bureaucracy also comes into picture. You know, filling form for every trivial thing, that means you know, you're wasting people's time so you, know, you need to trust your people and 90% of them may be doing the right thing. 10% which are not doing the right thing, just make sure that they really pay the consequences of that. Saying that 100% of the people have to fill a form for every trivial thing. So that's something you know, we need to really manage that carefully. I'm not saying that uh, people don't misuse it. As human beings, we all know that uh, you know, if, whatever the rules you come up with, you know, people always try to misuse some of them, but really action need to be taken on them rather than making everybody to go through huge amounts of bureaucracy as well. Funding mechanisms need to be developed. And then again, you know, some funding mechanisms could be within the institution and also you can leverage on the national programs as well. If you're really providing some funding within the institution is supporting so that you can really be able to attract the funding from the national, national programs as well. And reward and recognition mechanisms for excellence, for example. If people are doing excellent work, nobody cares about it and they lose motivation. So that's why recognition programs really make a big difference. An awards program, for example, every year you can give, you know, means a best physics, uh, you know, academic, you know, or a best physics chemistry academic, or, you know, best electrical engineering academic, or, you know, sorts, sorts of things, you know. You don't have to spend huge amounts of money. Some reward really makes people feel that in inst my institution really values my work. I feel motivated, I want to do more. It also gives an example for others as well, Oh, if the UD got the award and I should also try and then try to see next year, maybe I'll say aim for getting an award sort of thing. So that's what it really feeds on each other, for example. And I would always say that celebrate excellence at all levels. So that means it really sends a message that excellence is valued by the leadership of the institution. And that means people also try to aim for excellence as well. If you don't celebrate and people think that an institution or the leadership doesn't care about it, and then people don't really bother to do research and which really doesn't help the institution as well. So diversity is important. Again, encourage and support women, students, and staff. So again, with, that means if you're not really supporting them, 50% of the people are not able to contribute to our economy and our research and everything. So that's why it is important to make sure that diversity is maintained. So sometimes we try some things, we successful in some things, sometimes we fail in some programs. But as they say that people say that it's better to try and fail rather than fail to try. So don't be afraid of failure. I've shared my own failures, but if you're afraid of failure, you never take any risks. That means you'll not be able to achieve the full potential of the institution or full potential of the people as well. Sort of thing. Again, you know, the last week I had a meeting with Professor Brian Schmidt, whom you mentioned, our vice chancellor, and then he's we were discussing about excellence and other things. He said, yes, some programs we created have been successful. Some have not been successful. That's part of the life when you close this unsuccessful ones and try the next ones and then see how do we really be able to create some programs which, but we can never ensure that 100% of the programs which, which we start are successful. That's something which is really, you know, some, of course, you know, in some cultures and countries, including in Australia, failure is seen as not in a positive way, but Americans are very good in terms of accepting the failure. And in fact, if you fail and people are willing to give more funding to you know, startup funds and all these things sort of thing. So well, those are something which we need to learn, get out of that afraid, you know, afraid, being afraid of failure is not a good thing. Again, I mentioned that developing mentoring programs for staff and students is very important. Again, you, you recruit a, a new staff member, for example, make sure that you know, an established staff member acts like a mentor, so that's why they can steer them to the right direction and then encourage them and then really open the doors for them. 
that can make a big difference as well. Networking opportunities are also important. As Yuri mentioned that I've served on various personal society presidents and other things. There are many personal societies wants to start chapters in, in various parts of the world to really promote, you know, whether it is electrical engineering or material science or physics or chemistry or whatever the optics or whatever it is. And then, you know, really try to create some things and encourage your staff to become members. Yeah. And I know that salaries in, in India's nation are not that high. Sometimes membership fee may be too high. But I also am arguing with the professional societies that they should really make sure membership fee should be such that they should not be, you know, they should be accessible to people in the developing countries. And then, of course, they keep telling me that they are only charge the World Bank rates based on the income of the country. But institution also can support so they become part of the global network and global community, for example. And again, appoint, you know, do some appointments for overseas adjunct appointments. So that can open up links with the overseas academics. They can act like mentors for your staff and students. They may host some of your staff and students and other things that, you know, develops a bond between your institution and those overseas academics, for example. And please make use of Ind Indonesian diaspora for your advantage. So, you know, we always have that you know, warm feeling for our home country, respect of where you live. You know, that's your heart is always there in your home country. So it means, you know, by using an Indonesian diaspora who are successful overseas, by associating with your institution, giving adjunct appointments and encouraging them to come and spend some day summer, sabbatical, or summer breaks and all these things, that can also inspire and motivate people. People can relate to them much better, but can also make a big difference for the institution. And again, try to send your academic staff or students for overseas visits for networking and developing collaborations and also access equipment not available in ITB or in Indonesia. I know that ITB is a top institution in Indonesia, in, in Indonesia but sometimes, you know, all of us cannot have all the facilities. In fact, as I said, I collaborate with people from uh, all over the world, despite the fact that we got $20 million worth of facilities, which have established in the last 30 years or so, but still you cannot be expert in everything so that's why collaboration and those visits can make a big difference, for example. And then make use of government programs. I understand in Indonesia also, the government also started creating some sort of a visits program and other things. And if you don't have the right programs and advise the government, because you know, if the ITP leadership means, you know, government hopefully will listen to because you are leaders of a top institution in the country and thereby hopefully they'll in there, of course, governments always have to take care of the political issues and other things. But again, sometimes you provide the input and you never know when that input will be taken into consideration when they are making their decisions as well. Again, create two plus two PhD programs with overseas institutions to provide a joint degree, for example. So thereby some of your talented people are not le leaving ITB. They say that, okay, I'm happy to stay in Indonesia and then really do my part of my PhD program in Indonesia, part of the program in overseas. So I get the double degree. So that means, you know, that also helps my career as well sort of thing. So that can help also, hopefully they can come back and also develop the links between ITB and other institutions. Again, you can think of two plus two undergraduate programs with overseas institutions. And uh, this is something again, of course, a lot of work need to be done and you need to identify the right kind of institutions. Institution rankings are important for students and parents. I know that your government is talking about institution rankings. I know my colleague, Professor Brian Schmidt has mentioned that rankings are really distorting the system. But at the same time, whether we like it or not, and then the students and parents are looking at these things. You know? So that means, you know, in fact, even I was during my discussion last week with Professor Brian Schmidt, and he also mentioned that he did acknowledge though they're creating problems, but at the same time, we cannot ignore them, okay? You can really create your own metrics for excellence, but also see how institution can meet those rankings as well. So thereby you're able to attract the brightest students possible to ITB, if you attract the bright students and they do very well, and it also reflects highly on the institution. And you know, it's, that's why the excellence feeds on itself. So that's why it is important to really recruit excellent people. When people are looking at these things, we cannot ignore them, whether we like it or not. Of course, there are many ranking systems and other things, you know, different rankings look at different aspects, but it's important to make sure that you, know, you continue to stay as number one in the Indonesia, but also comparable to other institutions. You know, it may not be you know, Australia or Singapore or America or Europe, it could be comparing yourselves with, you know, with Malaysia, Vietnam, and other things, you know, similar economic countries. And then you should really have that sort of things. And then you can go to the next step and next step. Just to give an example, 20 years back, you know, NTU, for example, was not ranked very highly. But now it is coming out to be among the top 10 or so in Singapore, for example. 
So by investments and recruiting the right kind of staff and other things, they're able to achieve those sorts of goals, for example. It is possible to do it. These things take persistence and perseverance, constant investment and inspiration. Science is global and one need to claim global, global perspective. I'm not saying that you should not do science which is relevant to Indonesia, you should do that one, as well as you should do, do the science which really gets the respect from the international community as well. So both can go hand in hand. Sometimes people ask me, you know, what is important, whether it's applied science or engineering or basic science. I would always say both are important. In fact, our government is putting a lot of pressure on the universities, try to really focus on applied science. Yes, applied science is important, but if you don't have the basic science, you really lose the foundations or fundamentals. I always give an example. If you close the tap, water tap, and then hope that the water will continue to flow. Yes, water will flow, water, the residual water is there in the pipe, but then you have stopped the water to flow further because you close the tap. So that's how I give you the comparison of basic science or a fundamental science. It is like you know closing the tap if you stop funding that one. So both are important that, not, that need to be balanced carefully because sometimes some discoveries come, for example, Wi-Fi has been developed in Australia, has been developed by people, those are doing astronomy, looking at uh, you know the black holes and other things, for example. So you, know, you never know where the what comes out of so that's why we need to really help and support the creative people. Summer internships to excellent students to go overseas labs or in industries, for example, sometimes you've got Indonesian industry or overseas industry, they can go and spend some time, thereby they get the experience, industrial experience. Industry may like to recruit your students, which is a good thing for their career as well. Encourage entrepreneurship. Again, your staff members and students, you know, you can have uh, startups, you know, you encourage them to do startups and IP protection and li li licensing mechanisms of the IP, for example. And again, re reward the people, those are doing those ones, for example. There is something called, uh, US has created something called National Academy of Inventors. They are looking for chapters to be started in various parts of the world so that they really create that academic in innovation entrepreneurship, for example. You know, that's important for the future of the country as well. In fact, Professor Danny Shed, uh, Shetman from Technion, who won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for discovering quasi-crystals, he told me that you know, 30 years back when he realized that Israel is really doesn't have any resources, it has to rely on its people. And then he has gone and then started a course of the entrepreneurship course across the campus and 900 people started attending these courses. And that really helped them to really think, they don't have to start companies tomorrow, but at some stage in life, they think of you know when they got a brilliant idea and become entrepreneurial so that it helps the country and your institution as well. And social entrepreneurship of relevance to Indonesia. That's again, you know, develop some technologies which will benefit the country. So thereby politicians and others also see the value of ITB generating some technologies which are benefiting the country that really matches your interests and their interests as well. As uh, UD mentioned that ANU created something called Future Research Talents Program of Indonesia, which I will come back. Only two countries have created that one with India and Indonesia. And then because of the student who came from Indonesia under our endowment and which I'll come back to, and then that really made them to think that they want to really develop relationship with Indonesia, for example. This allows the students to, from the undergraduate students or master students come to ANU and spend up to 10, 10 weeks to uh, three months and work in one of the laboratories in the College of uh, Science and various places, including computer science or so. So thereby they get the experience of working in a top class laboratory and more importantly, develop the networks and then demonstrate to people how brilliant they are with the hope that they can really invite them back to do PhD or if not anything else, at least they got the international experience. Their horizons and outlook will be different. Again, American Physical Society has programs which allows American Physical Society fellows to go and spend some time in developing countries. And IEEE has got distinguished lecturer programs. If you create chapters, you can invite distinguished lecturers to come and spend some time at ITB and give talks and then interact with staff and students that can lead to collaborations. And more importantly, they act like ambassadors for you. You know, OSA, Optical Society of America has got traveling lecture program and all these programs you can leverage on. You don't have to spend your own money to do these things, but some things international programs are there. You should make use of them. Joining editorial boards of journals. And again, you have to do first of all, excellent research. And also when you're asked to do review of a paper, you have to do a good job with that one as well. Sometimes people want to write papers and want to be on the editorial board, but when they're asked to do any reviews, they don't really respond to reviews or otherwise they don't do a good job. That means you know probability of getting into editorial boards becomes more, more difficult as well. So it is possible to do a good job 
it does do recognize good reviewers. And in fact, even these days, some journals have got also reviewer recognition programs as well, for example. And organize conferences and workshops and webinars and invite experts to participate in these conferences that could lead to collaborations and also students and academics can get inspired, for example. So in fact, I'm working with uh, Professor Alice Chang from uh, uh, Peking University and Professor Paul Weiss. Uh, he's editor in chief of the ACS Nano from UCLA. And then I, we three are organizing these Icon X conferences on every other uh, seminars program and every Friday at 8 p.m. Beijing time. Sometimes it's 11 p.m. for me, for Paul Weiss it's 4 a.m. for him, but we do get up or we'd stay late in order to be able to really inspire the next generation invite some of the top experts and is open for everybody. And then you know, feel encouraged, in fact, uh, this Friday and the Mitten uh, City from Max Planck Institute is giving a talk on soft robots, for example. You know, every Friday, we end up having one person or the other, some international expert on one topic or the other, that again you know, inspires people and young people particularly learn without having to go anywhere as long as you got access to internet, for example. Philanthropy and endowments and bequests are also important for ITB. And you can target your alumni and staff and students, for example. And again, you know, you know Brian Smith, our new uh, vice chancellor, of course, he's been here now six years or so. I don't, I should not call him as new vice chancellor. He created a major philanthropy activity and then said, look, it is important to really reach out to our student, former students, alumni and staff and uh, other potential donors that can develop their bond between the alumni and the institution as well. Again, focus on excellence in every aspect of the institution, research, teaching and administration. You may be good in research and teaching if administration is not efficient. Again, it can lead to frustrations for people. But if administration is good and other two are not good, that doesn't really help you in terms of being able to give you the great experience for students and the staff as well. So that I'll stop there for the institutional advice. Now let me come to the individuals. Again, this is part of the talk which I gave two years back in Jakarta for individuals. Again, I always tell people, what should I choose? I always tell people that choose something you're passionate about okay, and have fun. If you're having fun, you don't really think about what's the time now. You know, I tell, we give an example. If you're playing video games and your mom or dad has to in, ask you to come and have dinner because you're too busy playing video games. Science is also the same thing. Research is also the same thing. You're having fun and people ask me, how can you possibly work for you know, 12, 13 hours every day uh, for, you know, 30 plus years? You know, I said, look, and I'm having fun, guys. I don't see my research as work, you know. And again, dream big and aim high. If you dream big and aim high, even if you achieve half of what you aimed for, you still achieve a lot. But if you dream low and then aim low, even achieve 100%, but you haven't achieved much, you have not made use of your full potential, for example. And again, whatever you're doing, always you need to look at the big picture view, world view of your work. You know, somebody apparently was uh, painting a wall in a NASA and a, planet, a, a group of people were walking through and they asked him, what are you doing? His comment was, he didn't say that he's painting the wall. He said, he's helping to put the man on the moon. That immediately tells you you need to really put your work into global perspective or bigger, bigger perspective of the institution or the goal which you have, rather than simply saying that I am doing this or that sort of, okay? That's very important. Self-belief is very, very important in life. Everything will be growing it if you don't have self-belief. Who else is going to believe you if you don't believe in yourself? So that's why self-belief, self-confidence is very, very important in life. There's a positive attitude can really make a big difference. Again, hard work is absolutely critical. Sometimes some people are brilliant, but they, they don't want to spend time on these things. Then they don't go anywhere as well. So the brilliance as well as hard work, it really goes well. In fact, you don't have to be super brilliant. You know, above average intelligence is more than sufficient. Along with the hard work, you can achieve anything in life. Okay? Again, sometimes people say that I'm working hard, but going nowhere. And then I always tell people, you know, work smart. What does it mean? Try to understand the system and expectations. If, you're, if your system or boss is expecting you to do something, you're working hard, but you're doing something else, but then you get a mismatch there. That's why it is important wherever we go, for example, some of your colleagues might have done their PhD in Japan or America or Europe or Australia, but when they come back to the Aust Indonesian system, they need to adopt themselves and try to understand how the system and how to, what are the expectations, so thereby they'll be able to meet those requirements. Persistence and perseverance and resilience is absolutely critical. We fail many times, but don't be afraid of that one. Never give up. Can do attitude is important. Don't procrastinate and use your time effectively. Sometimes, you know, 
is something you can do today, but you always say, oh, tomorrow I will do it. But tomorrow you may get something else. So that's why do it now. That's why when I get an email from somebody, I immediately respond. I don't sit on it because I forget about it. And people think that you're not responding, for example. Create core competency for yourself. You may be doing multiple things, but you need to be an expert in something. The rest of the world wants to come to you. So that's a core competency is absolutely critical. That's why people want to collaborate with this because we got certain core competency. Everybody really thinks that we are the world experts in that one. That's why people want to come and collaborate with us. And find mentors and who can guide you and steer you. And again, collaboration and teamwork is really a multiple effect, which I already mentioned. And so let me move to the next one. Let's see, let's see whether I can go. Okay. And again, you know, sometimes, you know, you may be good, but, you know, your social and leadership skills are not great. That's, again, something not all of us are born with the leadership skills we can all develop. Communication skills are important. You may be good in what you're doing. If you don't know how to communicate, whether it is in the written form or oral form, your public papers may not get published and your presentations may not look good and people don't appreciate what you're doing. So that's why it is important. I've already covered entrepreneurship skills and I've already mentioned about don't be afraid of failures. Failures are pathway to success. And honesty and integrity take you a long way. Sometimes people want to do dodgy things, but those things people get exposed very quickly. So that's why you always maintain honesty and integrity. That way you have the respect in the community and that's what really takes you a long way. Again, I mentioned about getting involved in the profession and again, be kind and generous to others, including your students and collaborators. And the kindness and generosity can take you a long way as well. Rather than always looking at, you know, what I want to get, I want to get from somebody, you're generous to others, others are also generous to you. So that's another thing which is important as well. If you do good work and being get involved in the community, recognitions will follow. So you don't have to chase them, okay? But in, you need to be involved in the community as well while doing excellent work. You know? Again, I keep telling about people, the pleasure of giving is much more in, immense than pleasure of receiving. Sometimes people are always focusing on, how can I get from somebody from this or that sort of thing? In the long term, they're never happy. They're always chasing the next thing. But if you start helping other people, the satisfaction you get is enormous and happiness really comes to you, okay? And again, work-life balance is important. Sometimes we may be working very hard, but if you don't look after your health or family, and then what will happen is that you pay, pay a big price. First and foremost thing is your own health. If you're not healthy, you cannot help your family, you cannot do your work. And then if your, if your family is unhappy, again, you cannot come to work and focus on your work as well. So the top priority is your own health, next family and work. But unfortunately, all of us give too much importance to work, only realize the importance of health and family after getting into trouble. Sometimes it could be too late as well. So that's something I want to really keep that in mind as well. Okay? And uh, so the, it's amazing that, uh, again, there's some quotes which I will leave with. It is, Harry Truman, the president of uh, America said, what is amazing that you can accomplish if you don't care about who gets the credit? Sometimes you get stuck about, you know, oh, I don't want to do this one, other person may get the credit for it. But the reality is that, you know, if you do things, you know, people do know who are the people those are doing good work and other things, you know, don't focus too much on, I only do things which will give me credit sort of thing. Again, Sir J.C. Bose, Jagadish Chandra Bose in India, he really discovered the wireless, and but Marconi was really, the rest of the world is giving him the credit for these things, and apparently Sir J.C. Bose was asked, what is, what is your thoughts on this, you know, you not getting the credit and Markani getting credit? His comment was, invention is more important than inventor. So he's very, very happy that he invented it rather than worrying about who is giving credit to him or not. These are really great people. We need to learn from them as well. Again, first prime minister of uh, uh, India, Jawaharlal Nehru said, develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. Once if you do that one, anything is possible. In fact, uh, 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 Nehru is the one who started IITs, Indian Institute of Technologies in India. Now, of course, you know, this in, in 50s or so, now within these IITs are world renowned and then they're producing outstanding people. Sort of thing. So let me finish off with this thing. Every person can make a difference to the country by staying positive and believing in themselves, working hard and smart. Indonesia has a great future. Its future is in your hands. You know, nobody else, as you, know, you can make the difference to the country. All of us can, as individuals, can do that one. Be proud to be an Indonesian. Work towards the success of the country, and you can do it. Okay. Let me finish off with the giving back. When I talk about giving back and you know, what I am doing, because sometimes it's very easy to preach, but you need to also practice what you're preaching as well. So as you mentioned, that I support schools in India, my, my own schools where I have studied, for example, some best student awards. And you know, one of the, my village school asked me, 
they need to have a room for a building, a uh, room for putting their computers. I said, okay, I'll donate some funds and you build that one sort of thing. And UD already mentioned about our endowment. In fact, this is the one which started, led to ANU starting this future research talents program with India and Indonesia. And then every year we start to donate some funds to the ANU. ANU matches that funding. My goal is that, you know, want to reach a million dollars endowment. So that means that stays in the ANU, even whether tomorrow I'm run over by a truck, it doesn't matter. And then some young people, the students and young scientists will benefit from that endowment because that generates about $45,000, $50,000 about half a dozen people will benefit from that sort of thing, okay? Again, this endowment is not for India, for any developing country. In fact, as you mentioned that not only we had students from India, we had students from Indonesia, and in fact, we were hoping that in 2020, some young scientists on the student also will come from Malaysia, but then because of COVID, they could not come, for example. And then again, we support something called Kiva, which is providing loans to entrepreneurs in 79 countries. So we give $25 loans, say for example, including we gave about more than 2000 loans to date. And in fact, some of them in Indonesia as well. So these are the people, they may have got a small shop or otherwise they've got you know, a cart where they're selling stuff. They want to expand that one. They need $1,000. 40 people from developed part, various parts of the world give $25 each. And 96% they repay back. So that means that really helping them and they provide their story as well, so, for example. And I also, we also provide most of the loans to women because if women are strong and then the families are strong, societies are also strong as well. So that's why it is important to do that one as well sort of thing. My goal is to reach 3000 loans before I retire, for example. Again, you know, the, I told you that I studied in front of a kerosene lamp and 700 African families have no access to electricity. And again, solar aid really provides, if you donate $5 US dollars, for example, and 70,000 rupiah. And in fact, there's an old slide. I don't know whether the exchange rate changed or not. And then you know, they can provide a subsidized rate of these lamps. And then again, that means, you know, kids in, not studying in front of this kerosene lamp, breathing kerosene smoke, and also the dangerous so fire and other things. They're able to really look at these ones in a clean environment where they leave the lamp outside, where the solar cells are charging the battery, and nighttime, they're able to use that one. As you know, that education is really that really makes the difference for those individuals and the society as well. But also recently, Pollinate Energy, a group which has started supporting women in entrepreneurs in India and Nepal, we start supporting them sort of thing as well. So like that, we support lots of entities in order to be able to really give something back to the community. I'm so grateful to the world. And so then I just want to really thank everybody who has really made the difference for me. And with that, I stop here. I know that I have taken a little longer than what you expected, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much for the excellent talk, Jagadish. And uh, I think uh, you already told us about your uh, personal experience, the role of the institution, and also the contribution for the society. And now I don't want to uh, get along to give a comment and, and, and to respond for your talk. Now I, I, I open uh, to the floor for the question and answers. Probably I would like to invite uh, some uh, question or comment from the team. Probably Pak Hermawan Diboyono, Pak Satria. Please raise your hands, Pak Bambang. So uh, yes, Jagadish will be happy to have a more discussion rather than... Uh, okay, please, Professor Satria, time is yours. Please uh, unmute your microphone first. Okay, thank you. It's a uh, it's very uh, interesting talk. I, I really enjoyed the thing. It's very... Uh, inspiring. Uh, my name is Satria. I'm a geophysicist. I'm, uh, uh, I graduated from uh, Canada long ago. Uh, I'm a, a movie goer. I, I like movies. And I follow some of these uh, career of uh, Hollywood stars. And it's related to your uh, uh, experience that, you know, you need a break. Some of these uh, uh, actors, they're struggling. They become waiters and playing a, a little role, you know, it's unimportant. Role. But occasionally, some of them got uh, got a break. And you uh, clearly mentioned in your uh, your presentation that you had that break. My question is, how we how uh, uh, ITB as institution give this uh, kind of uh, opportunities for the uh, faculty members, especially young one to have that kind of opportunity to get a break, you know, so that they could uh, uh, excel. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes. That's a very good question, Professor. And uh, so the 
the thing is that you know the if you want to get a break you need to be you know really interact with people right breaks only come from you see the professor who has uh, given me the break in canada i come to know through because of fact that one of my friends was doing peer post doc in queens university just to give an example again there i was interacting with other professors so that's how they came to know that i am a semiconductor person working in magnetics and they are the ones those who came and suggested that you know in australia there is an opportunity for example so that's why the human interactions are really important so that's why i'm suggesting inviting people come and you know be associated with your institution as adjunct professors and also come and attend conferences and workshops and other things so thereby they are interacting with students and the postdocs and young academics so thereby you know if there's a, you know they find identify the common interest you know suddenly that can lead to collaboration for example they may invite them to come and spend some time with them that can open a lot of doors that's why the human interactions are important so that's why i say that networking aspects sometimes networking has got a negative connotation i'm not talking about networking for the sake of networking to really do better science for example you know means you don't have to always look at you know what i'm going to get that person for by the way i started i the photonic society electron device society chapter in australia in 1993 in canberra many distinguished lecturers whom i invited they became my good friends they in end up promoting my research because i am sitting in australia but you know rest of the world doesn't know you know it's a small you know, one university here sort of thing and then they are the ones those are recommending me for giving invited talks and recommending me for journal editorships they became my referees for example so they nominated me for various things and other things because that exposure that's why i tell people <coughs> <coughs> excuse me every person who is visiting your institution is your ambassador so give them the great experience and expose them to what great work is happening at itb and then that can lead to wonderful things happening <coughs> okay thank you very much uh yudi i just want to go, share uh, one good news today yes please my paper in nature communication has been published great oh, news congratulations a good news thank you, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah okay this another question for the audience the first lay probably before we go to the chat room i would like to invite uh, uh, some question from the audience probably uh, fabrian prof hermawan prof abdu please if you have a question please yes, prof hermawan okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Jagadis. Uh, really an inspiring talk. If we look at your position right now, I think it need uh, an enormous energy to reach that kind of level. Uh, so my question is, uh, what kind uh, of source of energy uh, you can create from your own self, yeah, so you can reach at this uh, uh, current state, yeah. Maybe is it is it coming from your dream, and is it correct? If it is correct, what dream do you have? Uh, did you have uh, when you are able to create an energy needed uh, to move to a such high level? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Chirma Kasi, Professor Mohan, and uh, that's a very good question as well. So really, the you know means uh, surround yourself with the positive people. In, you know, in our yeah. communities, there are always people. Those are yeah. you know, only positive role models and negative role models. You know, there are people. Those are always looking at everything in life as you know a problem. Yeah. People, even though there is a problem, and they always look at it as an opportunity. So that's why it is important to have the right kind of mentors and also right kind surround yourself with the right kind of positive people, sort of thing. So that really makes a big difference in terms of our own mindset of being positive and uh, and then be able to inspire others as well, sort of thing. In fact, for me, the main focus has been to more to inspire my students and postdocs and also young people from all over the world. Seeing their success makes me very happy. So that's why I talk about pleasure of giving is much more immense than pleasure of receiving. And if you start up, you know, giving the more and more you're giving, more and more you come get back. in the form of the energy which you can create for yourself sort of thing so that's why pleasure of giving is very important so that's why making the difference for example a student or an young academic whom you supported and mentored they are successful that makes you very happy that motivates you to do more right so that's what really when we need to really essentially having good mentors surround ourselves with the positive people and thirdly start experiencing the pleasure of giving that could really lead to very positive environment around yourself one can create a positive environment for one one around oneself but again you now we all have problems you know I means for example even now when i apply for some grants and i am successful in some and then i don't get some 
we have to submit a paper to some journals, some gets accepted, some get rejected. So, but you know, then you can, I always tell my students and all, don't take too personally, you know, when a committee has to really choose, you know, only 16% of the proposals. And then of course, you cannot be always among the 16%, you know, sometimes you could be with the majority of 18, 84% who don't get the grant sort of thing. So that's why don't take it too personally, everything, because it's nothing is nothing, you know, nobody's against you. And nothing is I mean, essentially look at it in a broader philosophical perspective. Well, okay, this time I missed out and let me try next time. And if there's any feedback I get, I take that feedback on board. I try to improve my proposal and I submit again. A paper which has been rejected by one journal. And then I see that, you know, take, take the reviewer comments and then see how can I improve the paper and have they suggested some additional experiments or what or in a better interpretation. And then you really modify that one and then submit to another journal. And then you know, sometimes, you know, in fact, some of my students, you know, it's tell me that sometimes, you know, they've tried four different journals, they didn't paper didn't get accepted. I said, don't give up. You know, I mean, see, these things happen, but sometimes, you know, paper doesn't go to the right reviewer who really get excited by your work. It can also get rejected as well. So that's why it is important to really don't feel, take too personally everything. You know, once if you really look at a broader perspective and you know, one can really move forward and stay positive. Thank you very much, Professor Ramon. Very, very good question. Yes, thanks, Jagadish. And now we have another uh, question from Pak Bambang. Please, Prof Bambang, you raise your hands and give a, a question to Jagadish, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Jagadish, for, for your uh, inspiring uh, talk. So you, you mentioned uh, in, in your talk the importance of uh, recruiting the excellent uh, academic uh, staff of the university. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering what, what career scheme is, is used in most Australian universities when, when recruiting uh, academic uh, staff. Do you, do you agree with the opinion that the uh, tenor track uh, career scheme is one of the key uh, factors that uh, makes uh, most of the US universities uh, in general have an excellent uh, research uh, uh, culture? Uh, as uh, I noticed that most of Asian and Indonesian universities uh, do not have such uh, a career scheme, uh, except a few uh, that adopted uh, recently, such as uh, National University of Singapore and and, and TU uh, and, and some uh, a few uh, universities in, in uh, Asia. Okay. Terima uh, kasih, Professor Bamal. And uh, so this is really a very good question as well. So this is uh, the the important thing is that, you know, means, uh, tenure track in America particularly focus on tenure track positions. So that's yeah. the system is that, you know, bring, bring somebody and then really put the rigor. And then, of course, once they meet the rigor only, then only they get uh, selected for the position, a long-term position. And if they're not doing a good job and they say that, sorry, we're not really meeting our requirements sort of thing. That's one way of doing that one. The other way, of course, you know, in Asian countries and you know, including in Australia sometimes is that, you know, people end up recruiting with the hope that this person turns out to be good, but on paper, they're really good, but in reality, they're not that good. You know, that lots of times happens as well. But because some, because of the fact that, you know, the, that they might have done very well in a particular environment and they may not be able to adopt themselves to be able to adjust to the new environment and the process, they may not do very well. So then you're stuck with that person for 30 plus years or so, right? Because, you know, if you're in a system and you cannot get rid of them, you know, I know that it's very difficult to get rid of people, you know, most of the Asian countries, including Australia as well. So what we do in Australia is that, you know, we try to create some fellowship program and either the you know, government has got some fellowship programs and we try to recruit people first to those fellowship programs. Okay. So institutional fellowship programs are those fellowship programs. And once they come here and then start working with us, then we see whether the, really this person can really do a good job here in the, our environment. And then also whether this person can get along with people. Sometimes, you know, you may have a brilliant uh, academic, but you know, they're a very difficult people to work with. They create a terrible environment for everybody else around them as well. So both are important sort of thing, you know, basically somebody who can adopt themselves and be able to be collegial and then work collaboratively and cooperatively sort of thing. So that's why having this in between fellowship programs type thing, there you can attract people again, in India also, for example, they used to have something called uh, you know, some particular fellowship programs. They attract them to the institutions. And once if they're really there for three years or four years, they see how they're performing. And then they said, okay, this person, this is one. So now we can create a position for them. You know? So thereby, you know that you're choosing the best possible person. 
you know, okay. which very easy to do in you know, research in Cambridge or Oxford. But you, when you come home, and then will they be able to really do a good job? You know, that's something which is always a challenge. You know, because of course you cannot. That's what I always tell people. Even some of my friends, those who go back to India, I tell them you have to adopt to the Indian system. You should not expect that you know, if, you know, everything which you have seen in America or Europe, and or Australia. And then that same conditions will be really available or the opportunities are available in India. And you need to really adopt to the local things and then network with the local people, get guidance and mentorship from the people so that you really adopt yourself to the local conditions. And that's very important one. That's why when I was mentioning that everybody needs to be given a mentor and those people can really steer them in the right direction and making sure that you know what they should do and what they should not do. For example, you go and do wrong things already your reputation is ruined, that means it becomes very difficult for you to get out of that you know, negative reputation as well. So, so my advice is that, you know, either go for tenure track, and if your government or system doesn't allow you to do that one, don't recruit people directly to a faculty position, bring them for some time, and as a, as a fellow for two years or three years, and then see how they're uh, turning out to be, and then really give them a long-term position. If, if the tenure track system is not, uh, you know, means if you want culturally not accepted in Indonesia, for example. So those are things which we need to really always manage as well. Cultural expectations and system expectations and other things. I'll give you an example that uh, recently our University of Canberra is a neighboring university and a, pro a professor came from Canada as vice chancellor and then he introduced a new track position and there was a huge newspaper article saying that, you know, what a terrible system he has introduced here and people are under enormous pressure and they're working so hard and there's no shooting, they'll get a long-term position or not and all these things, you know, sort of because, you know, Australians are not used to that one. And then there was enormous amount of criticism for the poor man, for example. But I feel like what he was doing is a good thing, but then of course system didn't accept it. So that's why this, I call it as a cultural adjustments and, and adaptation is very really important as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much, Jagadish. Uh, and any other question for Bamba? No, I think. Okay, so uh, I would like to invite another question for the uh, uh, our colleagues for the audience. Please, you also can uh, uh, raise your hands. Oh, pa Erwin, uh, I, I read your your question to Jagadish in yeah. the chat room. Probably yeah. you also can. can can, can, can uh, uh, ask uh, directly to Jagadish. Uh, please, but you did read my question because I'm already in my son's class now. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> you cannot see the mess in front of the yes. computer now. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'm listening. I'll, yeah, <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll, thank you. Yes. <laughs> no, uh, I drew uh, your presentation. Prof. Well, Jagadis, we are waiting in, for in the background. Question. And uh, I will uh, read uh, uh, the question from the chat room. Here they are. Uh, I'm following your narrative, and it seems yeah. to me we need to go in detail in the process. Could you tell us a bit on how ANU could split the management to pursue the substantial goal, like you have mentioned, with practical goals, like metric, university ranking, and then how can we avoid to getting to practical? That's the first question. The second question is, University ranking distorted university decisions. Uh, I'm agree with your uh, text that, uh, is, uh, that the science is global. How can a university stay relevant locally and going global at the same time? As we know, that its country or nation would have its own structural problem. So that's the question. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and then I'll uh, just try to respond to that one. And then so first and foremost thing is that uh, the not every person can do everything. There are some academics, those are good in writing science nature papers. There are some academics, those are good in writing, doing applied work and trying to develop technologies and translate technologies and all these things. So that's why you need to have a spectrum of people in your academics. And don't expect the nature science writing paper person to go and then start companies and other things. And don't expect somebody who is doing applied work to write and publish papers in science and nature. Sort of. So there's really, there's a big spectrum which we need to really accommodate that sort of thing. In fact, during my discussions, again, Professor with Brian Smith last week, he did acknowledge, you know, there are some academics, those are good in writing science and nature papers. Some people are good in interacting with industry. We should support all of them. So that's why the full spectrum need to be supported. That's an important one. And again, and I mean, the thing is that, you know, okay, that's where you need to make sure that, for example, in some tenure track systems and other things, 
people only focus on publications but don't give credit to people those are doing in you know, applied work and commercial work and all these things so that's why nowadays in some institutions they're including that also as a select the assessment criteria to make sure that people those are doing these things which are of national interest and other things are not been disadvantaged because of the fact that our systems are so rigid only you're rewarding people with uh, just publishing papers that means you know people just don't want to do anything other than doing that one because our system is not allowing us to be able to really encourage and entrepreneurship and all these things so that's a, of course that's been a major issue with the universities and in fact over the years in fact now all the universities are recognizing and realizing and uh, there need to be a mix of those ones as well because governments are putting a lot of pressure on the universities all over the world and encouraging them to do more applied work sort of thing so that's why choosing the right spectrum of people we can achieve both the goals as well so in terms of rankings and other things i agree that you know this is for example even not only universities nowadays also for scientists you know where you are publishing you know high impact journal high impact factor journal or low impact factor journal and what is your hitch index in fact i joke about it these days before uh, you know if people introducing themselves you know they say that oh my name is jagdish and my hitch index is this and what is your name and what's your hitch index sort of thing you know so that what is you know the culture is changing but in my view those sorts of metrics are really unhealthy for doing long term science but at the same time we have to live with that as well so this is a bit of a balancing act again as i was mentioning that university rankings are not something which you really need, only you need to you only focus on that that's a message which i want to convey is you can really see what are the things which we can do to meet our university rankings of the external bodies also really focus on things which are really important for the institution or for the country as well so thereby you can have those both of them going in parallel rather than only focusing on those ones so that means what will happen is that you know you're missing out on a lot of opportunities because you're just because of course their their metrics may change tomorrow that means suddenly you have to change from those metrics to new metrics and all these things so that's why that need to be balanced very carefully again the thing is also for example don't expect an electrical engineer to go and publish papers in science and nature and they'll probably publish in ieee journals for example a chemist may publish in acj journals a physicist may publish in aps or iap journals so really you need to really accept that you know you cannot expect everybody to go and publish in these journals and then there are some people doing particular kind of work that meets those requirements and some people those are doing other things will not be meeting those requirements you have to accept that as well so again citations are also to be honest with you and so then you, know, you jump on to one field after the another you can get a lot of citations i can give you examples of those ones people started working on carbon nanotubes and they jumped onto that one they did a lot of work and then they meanwhile graphene came they jumped onto that one and the 2d materials and then they started getting more citations and all these things and uh, but uh, at the same time you know for example some other people doing organic solar cells and dyson stay solar cells and then perovskite solar cells again they generate a lot of citations at the same time if you go and scratch the surface and look at what they have really done you know but there's nothing much because they're just jumping from field to field to just be, you know float on the surface and in the process you know they don't get many recognitions because uh, just because they got metrics for example i am aware some people those who have been nominated for national academy of engineering or other fellowships of the academies despite the fact that they got a very high citation indexes and hitch indexes and all but still they don't get elected to you know various academies don't get many recognitions because people see that they have not really made any significant contributions except floating around from place to place so okay at the field to field for example so these are things which are need to be balanced very carefully for example if you don't meet some of those metrics you may not get funding that means you know again you cannot do research so that's sort of you know it's one of those things which we need to one need to be very careful with those ones sort of thing. for example i mean i got elected to you know i mean 11 academies of various india and europe and in australia and us and all these things but really with respect to lots of people get a much higher number of citations than i am but still you know they they are struggling to get into those ones as also so it all depends on you know, what are the core things you contribute to the discipline where people respect you and then see that okay this person has done this work so that's why you need to have a sort of a identity from the community you are known for something that's why i say that the core competency need to be developed i hope i have answered your question yeah thank you very much jagdish this is very enlightening uh, answers and now we have another uh, question from uh, Prof Wahyu Sri Gutomo, please, Pak Wahyu, you raise your hand. It's your turn to give a question. No, please unmute your microphone first. Uh, thank you, Pak Yudi. I want to ask Pak Jagadis. Uh, as you know that 
Indonesia belongs to the group of developing countries, which of course its higher educational and research infrastructure is uh, very limited. And of course, including ITB. And this is uh, what I need uh, the comment from Pak Jagadis. Sometimes we, sometimes we find that outstanding achievement of a faculty member is mostly because of his or her own high quality or individual struggle and not so strongly related to the systemic condition of the institution. Uh, what is your comment on the efforts of making closer the individual achievement and the systemic effort of the institution? That's all, Pak Jagadis. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wayu. And uh, so basically, there are two things, you know, make again, individuals need to be first of all, and more importantly, the motivated and inspired. We need to set up the mechanisms which will really allow us to be able to do that one. For example, just to give an example, and uh, so then, you know, you win a small award, for example, you get a nice letter from your rector. Congratulations, Professor Wayu, we are proud of your ac accomplishment and, you know, really you're wonderful to have you in ITB. Think about it, how, how wonderful you feel, right? You feel wonderful. Oh my God, my rector recognized me, you know, sent me, has made the time to write a letter and then sent it to me. It feels you motivated and you want to do more, right? Because, you know, this is sort of, and that's why small things, it doesn't have to be a huge amount of money or anything. Small things like, you know, for example, even the rector doesn't have to write the letter. You can make sure that, you know, the assistant is writing the letter, is just signing and then make sure that the right assistant is doing that one. You feel good about it. But whereas you send something to your rector, but you don't even get any response, for example, or a vice rector, whomever the leaders of the you know, institution is, you feel demotivated, right? Well, ITB doesn't care about what I've achieved. So that means, you know, so that's why we need to look at always individual success as institutional success. I always tell my group members, it is not the success of me is a success of our group. It is all of your success is a success of our group. Because you know, all, the, all your success really reflects on me as a group leader. But your success is very important. So once if we have that sort of mindset, all of our staff success and student success is a success of ITB. The way you look approach this thing will be quite different. Simple mechanisms, you know, just a congratulatory email, for example, a small letter, you know, saying that makes a big difference to the individual sort of thing. Okay. In terms of the institutions also, to be honest with you, leaders are also uh, the leaders also feel motivated when they see their staff and students are doing very well. They want to create a better environment so that they can do even better as well. You know, again, you know, success feeds on itself. Positivity feeds on itself. So that's why the creating the positive environment and appreciative environment and recognition environment really create a, an enormous amount of difference. But of course, in, institutions also need to really find resources to be able to support the, you know, the staff to be able to do some research as well. And so, because if you don't have any facilities, as I mentioned earlier, it becomes very difficult to really for people to do it. And otherwise you're overloaded with too much of teaching, for example, you don't have to try and do research. And that means you're exhausted and going home exhausted sort of thing as well. So that's why, again, you know, you have to fill for every trivial thing a form, for example. Again, you know, you're exhausted by filling one form after the other. And the process, you know, you really don't have motivation to do research, for example, so, right? So that's why the institutions can do some things. Of course, the resources is one thing, and the mechanisms you set so that you know you're not you're really removing the barriers for people to be able to do their job much more efficiently of course can be motivated so thereby it's a success story for all did i answer your question yes i got the picture thank you yeah. thank you thank you jagadish and profile you for bang bang. so i invite another question for the audience bu endang Bu Endang ingin bertanya, the alumni of ANU, don't you want to talk, uh, ask something about uh, uh, what kind of change in the, the ANU policy currently? Bu Endang, are you still with us? Yes, please. Bu Endang is a uh, dean of our uh, SCTH, I mean, uh, biology and uh, life science and technology faculty. Please, Bu Endang. Thank you, Pak uh, UT, Professor uh, Jagawis. Uh, can I ask you uh, something uh, not related to the research, but uh, the arrangement of study programs? Uh, uh, in ITP, we are thinking about uh, making a postgraduate 
uh, study more interdisciplinary nature. Uh, could you share some uh, uh, a picture how uh, how flexible the study at postgraduate level to uh, to um, embrace the interdisciplinary nature? Thank you. Okay. Uh, terima kasih, Prof. And uh, so really, uh, that's a very good question. And in fact, science is becoming very multidisciplinary. And uh, so that means, you know, we really need to really get out of our, uh, you know, the so-called silos of I'm a physicist or a chemist or I'm an engineer or I'm an electrical engineer, or mechanical engineer, or biological engineer, and all, bi bi biologist and all these things. So really, for example, you know, means I'm working with my colleagues in neuroscience and stem cell biology and artificial intelligence on a project on developing nano electrodes for studying brain, for example, okay? So that means it's a purely multidisciplinary project. I'm learning a lot, okay? So that's why it is important to really encourage this multidisciplinary thinking because problem doesn't have a definition of, you know, it's a physics problem or a chemistry problem or a biology problem. Problem is a problem. Sometimes you may have to use multiple techniques or multiple ways of looking at a problem to solve the problem, for example. I call sometimes as a systems approach sort of thing, okay? So that's why it is important to have some master's programs in these multidisciplinary fields. I don't encourage people to do the undergraduate programs, the multidisciplinary fields for simple reason, then people get stuck in this mindset. They're only in that thing. For example, in Australia, there are some courses that have been started at the bachelor's degree in nanotechnology. But you know, for example, you know, tomorrow it could be Pico technology or some other technology, but then you're confined to one particular thing. That's why you become like a physicist or a chemist or a biologist or an engineer. And then you go and do the master's at the multidisciplinary level. So that means tomorrow the fields are changing and you still feel as your, your electrical engineer or a biologist. And then you can go in and work in the new area without the mental block. That's a problem. Lots of times people have this mental block that I am this. And they don't want to get out of that mental block or shell. So that's why it is important to really have the basic sciences and engineering, basic courses, degrees, which we have at the bachelor's level. And at the master's level, we really need to have a master's degree in nanotechnology, or artificial intelligence and data science, or you know, means, uh, you know, genomics and phenomics, and uh, whatever you know, means, uh, see, you know, the, whatever the technologies which are you know, neuroscience and uh, you know, means, uh, neurotechnologies, for example, and then people can really come with the diff different discipline backgrounds and learn something new that can make a big difference for people, for example. You know, that's very important as well. Multidisciplinary is very important. For example, we got master's programs in you know, means energy technologies, for example, here in the new. And then you know, means, uh, we got a programs in the photonics area. And we're not giving a bachelor's degree in photonics, but we're doing it at the master's level, for example. Okay, that's so true. the master's level at the nuclear technologies, for example. For example, if you give a bachelor's degree in nuclear physics, then you always think that you only know nuclear physics, but though you have a lot of capacity to do other things, for example. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you, Jagadish. Well done. Any other question? Probably from Pa Abdul. Pak Delik, Pak Wijaya. Yes, we have another question from Bu Sri Harjati. Please, Bu Saharmi. Thank yeah. you very much, Pak Yudi. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor uh, Jagadis, I completely agree with one of uh, your statement that basic science is much important as uh, engineering or applied science. Uh, here in Indonesia, we have uh, the government uh, uh, focus on uh, result or uh, sorry for product or patents. So more, more, uh, many grants are required, uh, especially the multi multi years grant. The requirement is a uh, patents, and uh, it. Uh, it expressed in our uh, roadmap, research roadmap, or a uh, faculty strategic plan that uh, some of us uh, have uh, put a very uh, small portion for basic science. Uh, that's, uh, I, I try to understand that we, we want to achieve what the grant uh, output or outcome. Uh, how the best way uh, to accommodate uh, the demand or uh, the it's I, I, I would not call it pressure but you know we understand we need to catch up with the technology and so on and so forth uh, any suggestion professor thank you 
Okay. Uh, the, 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 thank you very much, Professor Hajati. This is a really very interesting question and a very important question. This is a bit of a balancing act. So it's always a challenge. You know, governments always want to have short-term returns because see, political cycles are four years or five years, you know, what they can show as outcomes from their point of view. And then we may say that, you know, it will take 20 years, you know, for example, when you talk about the blue LED technology or any technology which you look at, it typically takes 20 to 25 years before that gets into a commercial product, for example. But if you stop doing that fundamental things, you know, then those new things may not come out. And that's something which we need to make our educate our politicians and policymakers sort of thing. I'll give you one example. So then I was evaluating a research program in New Zealand. And that New Zealand program said that, you know, you need to generate patents and also you need to start startup companies from this program. So we spent three days evaluating various proposals and you know, people came and presented their what they've done and they started so-and-so company and all these things. So after finishing these things, you know, I asked the, uh, the government people, you know, uh, colleagues, can you just tell me what is a success rate of startup companies in New Zealand? Generally, globally, it is 10%. What is the success rate of startups in New Zealand? And then they said 2%. Then I said that why these people are all starting startup companies, you know, when the success rate is so, so low, but because of the program required that they need to have a startup company. And of course, I look back now after five years and none of the startup companies have survived. You know, the human behavior changes when you really do some things, you know, people end up coming up with various things, but then in the process, it may not really lead to in the long-term outcomes, which you're hoping for. Short-term, it may look really good, but in the long-term, that may lead to not lead to great outcomes. So my view is that, you know, we really need to have at least, uh, my advice to governments is, you need to have a mix of programs. Some fundamental sciences are the basic sciences, some applied ones, and some also can go to the industry level, translating technology to the industry as well. So all three programs need to be there. And then depends on the what is the you know the intentions of the government. You can really have the mix can be changed. At the same time, if you really have this in so-called in investigator-led ideas-based grants are missing, that means you miss out on a lot of opportunities for innovation in the longer term. Okay, so that's a challenge, and that's where I think you know means the policy. You know, again, the leadership of the institution can go and then really convince the government, or at least tell the government you know why this is important. And then again, for I'll give you another example, Japan. After the World War II, and then of course, you know, they had a lot of problems and all these things. And then what they end up doing is that, you know, they end up uh, focusing on only applied work. But then suddenly they realize that, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do commercialization of technologies? What you can do when you don't have any basic things to really commercialize for? So then they realize that you need to really start investing both in fundamental sciences as applied sciences. And now Japan invests huge amounts of money in the, you know, for example, in the fundamental sciences, for example. That indicates also in their Nobel Prizes and all these things as well, for example. You know, again, China realized that you, know, you need to have the full spectrum and then they try to do, again, uh, you know, fundamental sciences as well as applied sciences as well. India is doing the same thing. This pressure is always there from the policymakers and politicians. It's our job to really educate our policymakers and politicians, convince them at least some percentage need to be really supported based on the investigator-led ideas grants and other ones could be applied ones to meet their policy requirements or otherwise political requirements. You know, politicians are also have got a competing uh, demands on their, uh, you know, time and money. And then of course they need to make those decisions and that's where the challenge comes for them as well. So that's where working with them is an important one. Again, also I'll give you an example that when so we met with some politicians and I was a vice president of the Australian Academy of Science. And then uh, the, one of the politicians told us, guys, you guys come once in a year and tell us how important science is. Every day we see half a dozen lobbies telling us about what is important and that is important and all these things. So that's why, you know, you should really knock on our door more often so that we realize the importance of science and research. So that's something we also have got the duty to really engage with the policymakers, make them aware of the importance of the investments in the longer term while pursuing some of the short term ones as well. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you very much, Digadish. Okay. Another question, please. Yeah, Pak Yudi. Uh, yes, please, Pak Wenton. Yeah, uh, uh, Prof. Jagadish. I think the situation in India may be not very much different with us here in Indonesia in terms of uh, maybe salary and also the situations that we face with the research 
uh, how do you think we can build or promote uh, high quality research with this kind of situation where we actually have a low salary and no incentive and yeah, uh, such kind of things. Uh, maybe you have some experience with India. Yeah, sure. Of course, uh, to truth, when I was doing my PhD, the only uh, machine which I had is a simple thermal evaporator. And then only wafer which I could afford is a mica and glass slides. I could not afford silicon or anything that's hard to deposit in films, for example. I used to go to an electrical shop, which they used to use mica sheets as an insulator. I used to buy them and cut them into pieces and cleave them, and they're really freshly cleaved surface, and then used to deposit uh, by using a simple evaporator and then deposit thin films and uh, used to do the measurements, you know, in, used to go for X-ray measurements in geology department and uh, some, you know, uh, some other defense labs to do some other measurements and all these things. Sort of thing. So I have gone through that in, in my own life experience, not uh, as, uh, you know, hypothetical here. But uh, so this is basically, that's where the sometimes also challenge comes is that, you know, that's where sometimes, you know, you cannot increase the salaries of people overnight, because these are things the economy need to grow. Once the economy grows, also salaries hopefully will also grow sort of thing. And so that's where the institutions can come in terms of uh, the incentive mechanisms, which will allow people to feel that, okay, I got all these constraints within, within my constraints, what best I can do. By the way, I can tell you that during my PhD in the 80s, I'm talking about, I still published 16 journal papers during my PhD uh, in, in international journals, you know. So that means, you know, it is possible to do it, but it's a motivation is important one sort of thing. You, know, you really need to say that, look, I'm not going to you know, go to America or going to live there. I'm going to live in Indonesia. I'm working in a best institution in the country. Uh, and, you know, let me make use of these opportunities, see what best I could do. Rather than thinking that, you know, I want to be like somewhere in Japan or America or wherever, Australia, but, you know, under the circumstances in Indonesia, what can I do? But again, institutions can help. Also, individuals also need to motivate themselves and then see what best I could do as well. Again, recognition mechanisms and the rewarding mechanisms certainly motivates people. Yeah. See, showing appreciation, which doesn't cost you too much, can make a big difference in the motivation level of people. So that's a simple things, you know. You tell your student you did a great job. You know, somebody, you know, somebody gets uh, published a paper and our colleague told us that he published in Nature Communications. Let us celebrate that, you know. If you start celebrating everybody's success, it feeds on itself. And that means, you know, you can also, institution also becomes an excellent place as well, sort of thing. You know? That's why, that's by the way, that I also tell people, the ego and jealousy are some of the, basically the, what should I call as the major enemies of the human beings. If you're jealous of somebody, you're feeling better about yourself. Basically, the people say that jealousy is like, you know, Taking poison and then you know you thinking that somebody else has to die, but you took the poison. Jealousy is like that. So that's why get rid of the jealousy first and get rid of the ego as well. I was talking to one of my American colleagues and who is working in Korea. He's managing a big center. And I asked him, how do you manage this sort of thing? He said, culturally, it is different. You come from American system. He said, of course, outside the discussion room, I'm seen as a director of the center or the institute. But inside a discussion room for science, we are all equals. You don't have to worry about, I am the director of the institute. We are all, we are all scientists and we are really working together. So that's why sometimes you know, these hierarchical things also can create problems. We need to get rid of that one. We're all human beings. I'm a great believer of saying that you know, humanity is the same. And really, we can respect each other. But at the same time, also celebrate our successes. And then again, you know, recognize our colleagues. So thereby, we're all feeding on each other, creating positive environment. And that can lead to lot of great outcomes for institutions as well and individuals as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Jagadish. Uh, there is another question. I invite another question for the audience. Bu Aang. Pak Delik, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Yudi, and uh, it's good to be here and to see the presentation of Professor Jagadish. And surely there are many things that to learn. I'm just uh, with regard to some of your points, what I could see in, there are some cultural barriers that we have, I think, in some of our Asian developing countries uh, in respect to how to, to think like, like, you, like you do in, in, in ENU, for instance. Uh, first, 
first in, in my in maybe is my word that we have a kind of a experience of uh, being in an instant pragmatic cultural society where sometimes we of as uh, often over evaluation or over admiration over admiring certain fancy uh, criteria or let's say ranking metrics those and this other kind of uh, universal or simplified indicator and uh, meanings that we are looking toward the the result we want to have this this looking at the look and we sometimes forget the the joy of being in the process or seeing at the fundamental things that to become like any there is certain things that we have to do not just looking at the figures from the outside but there are things uh, that we have to do that sometimes it's uh, uh, can be uh, hurt or can it's not enjoy thing to to change thing and that kind of culture is I think a, a, a bearer I don't know wondering how probably uh, whether you also experience that kind of situation and how can we mitigate that and the second uh, barriers I think it we are also tend to have a more transactive culture we are more uh, eager to have like punish and rewards uh, situation of okay, I give this money and then I will do the research. And, and instead of building, let's say, I'm, I'm needing a, a wider conducive environment and I need appreciation. And that, and that kind of a situation is uh, still, I think, uh, lacking. Uh, this making uh, that stuff, okay, I will work because to meet this expected standard, okay, I get Q1 and blah, blah, blah. And not pursuing something beyond, it's like you said. Uh, I think that that's also another barrier uh, in overall. And whether uh, that kind of uh, things, uh, how to mitigate that? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And that's a very good question, Eric, and then uh, really very interesting. So really, the again, I agree that you know these rankings and other things are uh, uh, the you know distorting the science. In fact, I tell people that you know H index and then the impact factors really are ruining science sort of thing, and because of the fact that uh, people are really just focusing on you know what is impact factor of the journal which you're publishing. But I can also tell you that just because you publish in a high impact journal doesn't mean that uh, you know that's a high impact work. Sometimes you know means uh, the, uh, the the you know citations, for example, I can go and look at my own papers. Sometimes some of the papers which I publish in applied physics reviews uh, letters have got uh, much higher citations than some papers I publish in physics review letters, for example. Okay, so just because we publish in a high impact journal doesn't mean that it's high quality work. But of course, it depends on which reference it goes to and all these things sort of thing. But of course, people also like to play these games about you know playing with the metrics and you know jump from one to another and all these things. But uh, I agree with you in terms of your comment about you know joy of the process. And otherwise, people always tell you in life, the journey is more important than the just destination. Sometimes people focus on the destination and forget about the journey. And they really don't know after reaching the destination, they realize that they, they didn't know what journey they have passed through sort of thing. So that's something one need to really create that culture of you know, enjoying the experience of doing fun, fun research and working with students. You know, sometimes I can tell you, we work on sometimes on some projects, you know, and after four years, nothing comes out of it. But then you say that, look, you know, it's, if, you know, you need to really keep on staying positive and then discuss these things and why that's not working and what can we do. And then, of course, sometimes students can also get frustrated and all these things. And that's where you need to look at, OK, this particular project is not working out. And how do I make sure that this person gets a PhD? So that's why what I end up doing is that I end up giving you know, multiple projects to students. So thereby, even one of them works out, and they can get a PhD and all these things as well. Sort of thing. Cultural issues are always difficult to change overnight. And these are the things which we need to really go and then start doing this ones in a, in, in a, in a positive way but also in a long-term way sort of thing. You know, this transactive culture is pointing out, that's a human nature. But I can tell you that, you know, after collaborating with people from 30 plus countries, you know, means, uh, you know, means, uh, people from Sweden and Norway and then uh, Finland to people in uh, South Africa and Brazil to China, India and Korea and uh, Taiwan and uh, Japan and all these places. In my view, the human beings are the same. If you are generous to others, they are generous to you. If you become transactional and then you want something based on what you've done to them, they'll become transactional as well. So those relationships don't last that long. You know? So that's why you need to look at in a holistic long-term perspective and then see that, look, you know, means I want to really help my colleagues. What can I do to help this person? And other people also exactly think the same way. So that's why that's something that, that, need, that takes a long time to be changed that culture. Mind you, 
you know, there's two things, you know, but interestingly, we talk about Asian systems, but the Western world, you know, there's always individualistic. Asian or the Eastern systems are more collective systems because our systems are such that we have to help and support each other. That's the only way in the societies you can uh, survive because you don't have all the facilities you want to have or uh, you don't have the right mechanisms to be able to get everything what you want. So okay, economically, we're not well enough to be able to do that. So that's why the collective approach is a much better approach than individual approach. But that's why you know I encourage, as, as I mentioned earlier, that you know means uh, the instead of thinking about you know what I want all of my students and postdocs to do everything so that I can be progressing. That means I failed as a leader. Leader's job is to make sure that everybody is successful around them, so thereby everything reflects on them as individuals. So, so it's, a, it's a challenge. It's not an easy one, and this is something which we need to really create those cultures. Again, leadership can really play an important role. And okay, you got this published. You know, who are the people, those who collaborated with you, helped to be able to do that one? Again, when we're doing authorships, for example, ask the question, who else, who are, who are all contributed to uh, this work? And then if somebody says, well, that person helped me, but you know, it's not that important. I said, without that person's help or contribution, is this paper could have been as good as what currently it is? The answer is no. Then you say that it's fair to really give them the credit. So, okay. Sometimes people in do just look at the me, me, me type thing. It really doesn't help in the longer term sort of thing. You can only exploit people once or twice. People don't want to work with you. if You're seen to be using them for your advantage, but you're not really thinking about them, not giving credit to them and all these things sort of thing. But again, these, these sorts of things don't happen overnight. In fact, I'm very fortunate. I got a wonderful group of people. And in fact, I got some tenured full professors in my group, my former students, and they still want to work in the group because they say, look, you know, we're working together, working together is much more fun. They could have gone off and started their own independent research groups and other things, but they didn't do that one sort of thing because they know that they get credit for work they're doing. So, so giving credit where the credit is due is important to motivate people and also people make to feel that uh, they're part of the team and the entire team will benefit if uh, people are working together. I hope I've answered your question. It's a complex and difficult question. I hope uh, at least partially I've answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much, Dagarish. So another question, please. Okay, while waiting for another question, Dagarish, uh, I would like to tell you something about ITB currently. Uh, we are towards the multiple campus. Now we have uh, uh, in Ganesha in Bandung. We also have in Sumedang, uh, and, uh, close to this Bandung city. And currently we are in progress to open up a new location of ITB in Cirebon, probably about four or five hour by car from, from our uh, uh, headquarters in, in, in Bandung. And so you tell us about the criteria and requirement to have a research and scientific culture of excellence, right? And then uh, now we are still in progress to strengthen what we have in, 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 in Ganesha and in, in, in Bandung. But in the same time, we also would like to, to expand uh, our, our uh, let's say, uh, services to, to, to another locations. And uh, could you give some, some insight of idea? Uh, as, I, as I know, in 1990, you initiate the research program. Uh, you are a founder of the Australian nanotechnology facility and so on. And you mentioned that there is some, for example, we need a space, we need a funding for the facility, we need a building, we need the, the, uh, to, to hire the, the, the excellent people, right? uh, human resources. So could you give us uh, an idea or insight where we should start to, 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 to let's say, to initiate, not, not to maintain, because probably we don't have the, the chairboard, right? And uh, we have limited resources. We, 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 we don't have a, a huge uh, resource like a money, like a funding or this thing. So can, can, can you give an idea when we, we, we should start uh, to, to realize what, what we want to, to, to achieve? Okay. Thank you, Eddie. That's a very good question. And then uh, I didn't know about multiple campuses of ITB. I've learned something new today, which is good to know. And so what we have done in the case of Australian National Fabrication Facility is that we didn't want to really create a facility in one institution in the entire country and expect everybody to come to that institution and then make use of the facilities sort of thing. In reality, in big countries like Australia or Indonesia or India and other places, it doesn't work, okay? You need to have a distributed network of facilities which can be really working together. For example, Australian National Fabrication Facility has eight different nodes. 
you know, there's a node in Queensland, there's one in Victoria, you know, there are three nodes in New South Wales and one node in Western Australia, there's one in South Australia, eight of them. Really focusing that particular node on the local expertise of the people, so thereby they know what's happening, they really make sure that those equipment are working well, and then the people are they are able to make use of those facilities and also be able to advise external people how to use a particular piece of equipment and all these things as well. So, so that's why I would encourage, you know, if you're establishing facilities, you should, of course, you need to have facilities. You can, without facilities, you cannot do anything. Without space, you cannot do anything. In fact, by the way, we are building just now in physics, you know, means uh, the $220 million new building in physics and uh, $60 million has been invested for our clean room or nanofabrication facility at the central part of the building, for example. But that didn't happen overnight, you know. We had to really work on this with the university and other things for 20 years. That why we need the building and why we need to really have the coordinated effort in terms of facilities and all these things. So that's something, you know, which you need to be a collective way of doing things. You know, for example, you can have also work with other universities and then really try to say that, look, you know, we want to really, you know, who else, who else want to do the, for example, you know, the fabrication of materials or, you know, growth of materials or whatever the technical thing which you're doing, how do we really pool our resources and work like a network and then help and support each other? That's why the professional staff looking after the equipment is becomes important. For example, some of our staff, they, somebody sends them a sample, they deposit something and they send it back. You know, so they, they, of course, if you, are come, if you want to come and use the facility regularly, they train them so that they can, students can come regularly and make use of the facility. You only want to use it once or twice and our staff will do things for them. So. So you really need to create the environment and the mechanisms which will allow the multiple people can benefit from uh, the any facilities which are establishing. That's why I said like, this open access to all the facilities is a very important thing. It's not easy. People want as a mindset. We all want to have, oh, I want to protect my own equipment. Others people may come and break the equipment and all these things. But uh, the but that you know that's not a healthy thing in the longer term. And uh, so in the process, what happens is your investments are not really leading to great outcomes for the institution or for the country from that point of view. So, okay. so the investments are important from the institution and absolutely, and also this open and collaborative attitude need to be developed by people rather than people living in their own silos. Also the facilities could be distributed in multiple campuses, for example, if it is ITP campuses, and thereby you're not duplicating the effort. And then people know that, you know, if I want to do, for example, SIMS measurements in one facility has got that one, and somebody do electron microscopy, and some other facility has that one. We are able to collaborate and cooperate. So, and again, wherever the credit is due, give credit to people as well, and they contribute to the work as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Jigadish. Your question. Yeah, we will keep in mind and put your idea and, and, and suggestion in the uh, in our uh, uh, policy. And I think uh, our rector already rejoined us uh, now. So can I invite uh, Professor Reni? Bureni? Yes, please. Uh, this is your time. Okay, thank you. Jagadish, yeah, please. thank you, Pak Yudi dan kawan-kawan semua. Uh, Professor Jagadis, how are you? Thank you again. I left a little while ago, but I'm back now. Uh, I didn't really, I mean, I listened to the few six slides of yours. Uh, I have one uh, specific question. Uh, regarding, uh, we would like to have more visibility and reputation internationally. Uh, I think we would like to have more visiting professors up to ITB, uh, just short term uh, uh, about guest lectures or maybe stay with us a couple months during summer breaks. Uh, from our point of view, it should be very uh, interesting we will make uh, all the visiting professors uh, welcome and happy and uh, with our campus and um, interacting with us. But I don't know how attractive it is for such esteemed researcher, researchers such as yourself or your a bit younger colleagues uh, for such in invitation to a campus like ITB because we don't um, offer great uh, research facilities, laboratory, but we really think that we can afford a best atmosphere, uh, friendship, networks, and if IT, uh, ITB has very strong networks nationally, 
So if um, researchers from Australia and the relationship between these countries, Australia and Indonesia are very uh, tight politically, economically. So uh, if your colleague, colleagues would like to solve Indonesian problem, which, has, which are very international and challenging problem, we are your best partners. But what we offer is not a traditionally a research laboratory and funding, but I think we have good bargaining position. What, what is your uh, comment? Thank you. Okay. Terima uh, kasih, Professor Rainey. And then it's good to see you. And thank you for rejoining the meeting. And I really appreciate it. And uh, so you, you ask a very important question. Let me really go back in history and I'll tell you a story. For example, 30 years back, China's situation was not uh, as good as today, for example. So one, what they've done is that, you know, they've created some programs, for example, Thousand Talents Program, Young Talents Program, and then a short-term program and a long-term program, and allowing people to really come and spend three mo two months in a year, for example, during their summer break. And then they're able to go there. In fact, you know, early years, you know, papers from, you know, my colleagues in China, they know so publishing in high impact journals was very difficult, but now they publish in science and nature very routinely sort of thing, for example. So what these people have done is that at that time, they didn't have much facilities as well. And then by inviting them and then be associated with their institutions, even you can start with the diaspora themselves first. And then otherwise other people also can join. In fact, this program is open, but I had a position called Thousand Talents Plan Process in University of Electronic Science and Technology in Chengdu. But uh, I'm supposed to have spent two months in a year, but I didn't spend two months in a year, but I used to visit them often, you know, two, three times a year, it maybe spend a week or so. And because I was going to various conferences, other things to China and other things as well. So people do want to help and give something back. There are lots of people out there, those who want to help the developing countries and then give something back sort of thing. India has again created a program called GAN program. The GAN program, what this is uh, done is that uh, they invited some professors to come and spend some time and give uh, some short course, for example, on a particular subject. And then you know, also that means, uh, you know, is broadcasted to the, you know, anybody can join and then attend the, those courses. So thereby they're gaining the new skills and other things. And most recently they created a program called Vajra. And again, another program which is really attracting some of the people to come only if, come for short periods of time. People want to go and then do sabbaticals and all these things. Essentially what they're looking for is, because most likely they're getting most of their salary from their own institution. What they're looking for is some accommodation costs and some living costs, not asking for salary or anything of that sort, for example. Basically, they already have a home. That means if they have to pay additional cost of accommodation, it costs them a lot of money. So they simply say that we'll be happy to provide you that one sort of thing. But also there are lots of mechanisms also. You know, I mentioned about American Physical Society and various other organizations have got programs in IEEE, the Distinguished Lecture Program and other things. They can come and visit, in fact, those institutions provide a travel grant, for example. And then you can ask them instead of coming and giving a talk for two days and going back, how about you spending two weeks with us? We'll provide you the accommodation, some living expenses. You can interact and inspire our, uh, our young, young people, young academics and students. People are willing to do that one. See, I've gone for the first time to uh, China in 1996. You know, that relationship is still going on. I mean, so basically at that time, the facilities were not that great, but they've got only one or two, some special facilities, which we didn't have, for example. They were able to do some things which they were, that's why the uniqueness unitedly develops sort of thing. But we understand that the facilities, see people also want to have, want to interact with bright people. So if they come here and then interact with some students, they may find some students or postdocs whom they can recruit them later, for example. You know, again, everybody is ultimately, you know, the, the knowledge economy and it is the skills and expertise of the people are the ones, ultimately the people are going to play a very important role but finding that talent is always a challenging task. So if they, if they come there and be able to you know, identify some talent, be able to train them, they can come back. And again, sometimes people are always worried about brain, brain drain and other things. We are not discussing about brain drain anymore. We're talking about brain circulation. Again, for example, when you know Chinese and Indians and all have been going to America since 50s or 60s or so, so when these both the, both the countries' economies have opened up, when they're starting companies and all these things, their diaspora really played an important role because they're in a key position. They're able to bring some technologies back to their home countries 
and you'll be able to start parallel companies and all these things sort of things. So that's why it's a, we call it as a brain circulation sort of thing. Okay. So if if your Indonesian person goes overseas and living somewhere, they contribute to the economy, their economy, but you got a friend there. But if they come back and they contribute, you know, come back to Indonesia, they contribute to your economy for the next 30 years or so. So both ways we are a win-win. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jagadish. I saw that it's already 10 a.m. in the in Bandung. And uh, I think when we continue it, probably this endless uh, problem in question, right? And I think this is time for us to, to, to stop this discussion. And I believe that in the near future, we will uh, invite you again and or we, we will ask your recommendation to, to, to give some name of your, let's say, from mid-career or researchers, right? Like our, our, our colleagues in, in, in Adelaide uh, or Sydney and, uh, and the other part of Australia. And uh, I really thank that you uh, give an idea, a common and a good a principle, uh, discussion to us today, Jagadish. And uh, yes, uh, please uh, send our uh, warm greeting to, to our colleagues in ANU, uh, Jim Williams, uh, Lee Fan, uh, Fulan, and, and, and the others. And uh, I give back uh, time to, to our MC, uh, Grand Prix. Please uh, continue the program. Thanks, Jagadish, and, and all the audience. Okay. Thank you, Pa. Terima, terima kasih, Yudi. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Jagadish, for such an inspiring talk. And we would like, and I would like to invite uh, Professor Wenton, the Vice Rector of Research and Innovation uh, of ITB, to give a closing remark. And I would like to, rem uh, to remind all the participants after the closing remark by Professor Wenton, we would like to have a photo session. So please don't leave after the closing remark. Uh, so, okay, without further ado, uh, please, Professor Wenton. Uh, the time is yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you sorry. clearly. Okay, the Professor Jagadis, Bu Rektor, Prof Hermawan, and all uh, respected participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just a short uh, closing. Uh, it is a great honor today for Introtech Ali Balung to have the opportunity to witness an inspiring and motivational talk from Professor Jagadis. Based on his talk, we can see that Prof Jagadis also had similar struggles and obstacles to those we face here in Indonesia. Yet, with consistency and perseverance, he can overcome the obstacles and be excellent in research fields. I believe with the same spirit and resilience. All of us, the Civitas Academica of ITB, could achieve and establish the excellent research culture. I think the message from Prop Jagadis is very well delivered. We need to take the significant actions to develop our human resources and research facilities, flourish the collaboration rather than competitions, be persistent, and never give up. As I quote from Prof. Jagadis, it is better to try and fail rather than fail to try. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, we could learn from the failures, yeah, and they will lead the pathway to success. Ladies and gentlemen, last year was the centennial anniversary of ITB. As the oldest science and technology-based academic institutions in Indonesia. In our long journey, we have contributed to positively impacting technological development and building the nations we know today. Nevertheless, learning in a never ending process and we still have lots more to work on. This event has enlightened and motivated us to build a sustainable research culture within the individual 
university strengthen our advantages, capabilities, and resources while rectifying our limitations and vulnerabilities. Finally, we would like to deeply acknowledge Prof. Jagadis from, for making the time to share us a start and insight on how to build an excellent research culture for the long term. We hope that this is not our last encounter, but the beginning of wonderful opportunity for us to exchange ideas, broaden our horizons, and nourish collaborations among the institutions. Once again, please allow me to express our gratitude to Prop Jagadis and all participants for this enjoyable, successful, and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wenton. And again, thank you very much, Professor Jagadis, for the motivational talk to all of us. So, uh, Bapak Ibu, uh, all the participants, before we wrap up our today's webinar, I would like to invite all of the participants to turn on the camera okay. uh, because we will have a photo session and uh, IT staff from LPPM will help us to capture the moment. Please, uh, Pak Deni or Pak Rino maybe, or? Two, two, three. Next slide. Satu, dua, tiga. Next slide. Satu, dua, tiga. Satu, dua, tiga. Sudah, Pak? Ya. Yeah. So thank you very much for Bye -bye, everybody. Everyone. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, very, much. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. One of our staff will contact you soon. Sure. And uh, yes, I will leave the room. I will back to Bandung now. Okay. Yeah, see sure. you tomorrow. But bye see bye. You. So I'm always there to help, and then I see, consider me as a friend of ITB in Australia and ANU. We will. Yes. We will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much, Jagadish. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.